My name is David Gruskis from RAE, an SCRS board member, and today the Society of Collision Repair Specialists will be presenting spot welding, so you would have a good overview on purchasing a spot welder, on what you should look for in having one, in what the future may hold. So Toby, what is spot welding? Squeeze type resistance spot welding is that we're gonna take electrodes, we're gonna zap it with some electricity, we're gonna build up some resistance at that contact point. The resistance will be released in the form of heat, about 2,000 degrees. We're gonna melt the top layer to the bottom layer or whatever multi layers in there. We'll let it cool down and we have a spot weld um, in layman's terms. Uh, why do we want a spot weld? Uh, OE requirements, uh, easy to learn. Biggest thing is heat management. We have a very small heat area. And the third thing, the fourth thing would be uh, corrosion protection. Um, we don't have to remove as much corrosion protection around that weld to form it. One thing I hear uh, a lot is the shop having the proper power to operate a spot welder. So Kai, what have you run into in your own? One of the big considerations that you have to con uh, take advantage of is to make sure your facility has adequate power. Uh, when you purchase a spot welder, they use usually a three-phase type uh, power supply. If you're considering putting power in your facility, a great suggestion would be to put in more than you need. With all the new equipment coming out, you want to plan for the future since it is a very expensive procedure. Absolutely, yeah. You know, you, you, you look at how much the power companies charge just to bring in you know, the, the power that you need today. But like we've talked about, you look at the 440 that's coming, uh, uh, you know, Toby, uh, you, you see this more than, it, more, more than anyone. If a shop is only going to prep for today, how is that going to, how's it going to help them tomorrow? Because obviously knowing that the, the increases that we all face each day as far as the, 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 the level of equipment we have to buy in order to replicate the OEM, uh, what would you recommend as far as to plan on? Again, Kai said to, Kai said to overbuild, but do you see anything more than 440 coming? Do you see, do you, do you see the power increases coming more? Uh, there are machines out there now that are 440 volts. Um, it gives you more latitude on what you can do with it. Uh, uh, if you don't have it in your facility, uh, it might be pretty expensive to bring in a transformer. So, but the biggest thing that we need to do as an industry is that we have to understand that the power we have in our facility, uh, how to maximize it. And the biggest problem in today's shop is that uh, they don't have three-phase three running through their facility. And when they do put it in, they put the small wire in. Um, I suggest people when they put in these new welders uh, to put in at least number four wire, uh, 65 amp service. So you have to figure that in the cost of putting in that piece of equipment. Uh, call your electrician out. So when Toby's saying number four wires, he's meaning for the outlet just for the spot welder, the wire going to the outlet is number four, and the circuit breaker was a 65 amp breaker. Uh, what that would mean is if the wire's not the right size, you could have a bucket of water and it has a tiny, tiny leak in it that's just a drip, and that's the way you're using your electricity. But when you pull the trigger on a spot welder, a spot welder, as Toby said, the tips come together and it dead shorts. That would be like banging a hole in that bucket, all the water shoots out, so you've lost all the electricity for a thousandth of a second, so there's not enough power to replenish back to get the welder working. So it's predicated on the diameter of the wire going to the outlet. You'll have some electricians say use number two. And number two wire is really, really thick. It will not fit in some existing old pipes running through a building. It requires uh, a tremendous investment in your electricity. But as Kai said, his, he's, you're doing a shop right now. I mean, you- Well, again, back to that point is that to overbuild, considering putting a two-gauge wire in, many times when you have an outlet near a stall, 
there's a lot of shops that are going to need an extension cord to, to forever uh, placing the welder in the right spot to do the repair. So take that in consideration that most of the time you will not be plugging that welder into that plug. You may need to move that a little bit further away. So by putting a bigger gauge wire and it gives you that capacity. On that point, we've noticed a lot of shops, the older ones, the ground in the building was connected to the water pipe. And through the years, the water companies have changed their meters to plastic, so they've broken that connection. So you have to ground your outlets to earth. So that might mean driving the ground spike in by the outlet. It might mean at the panel. Uh, if it's old electrical conduit and it's been painted for many, many years and they're using the conduit as a ground, it's been broken. So you want to really check that. That's been a very big problem. You can notice it by your lights flickering when a guy welds or your computer's flickering. Um, we've just seen spot welders when the electric's bad, the spot welder can do significant damage to itself as well as other uh, electrical pieces in the building. But I have noticed spot welders are just changing dramatically. That uh, there was a spot welder that was great three years ago, yet it won't cover the amperage now. Why is that? You know, Kai, what do you, have you well, seen? You know, the issue is that you're making a huge investment in purchasing a spot welder, and its weakest link is the power. Uh, that's the focus that, that everybody needs to consider. It's just not to purchase the equipment, it's how you're gonna get this thing up and you know, working in your shop. But we've seen now these welders are pre-programmed where uh, they don't need to be set by the tech, they need to be just turned on and they go weld. Well, I mean, you have welders that have an automatic function and a manual function. Uh, a lot of the automatic functions, you know, ensure that a technician consistently produces a suitable weld. But the manual uh, emphasis of it takes into consideration if you have a power supply issue that you can sometimes modify that to work within that parameter. Toby, what's the most, like, what are you most familiar with with the spot welders you are training and working with? Automatic ones or manual ones or? Semi-automatic. Most of the, in the, I mean, the automatics are just fairly new over the last maybe three or four years. Um, before that, most of them were semi-automatic, where you would uh, select the type of metal, if it was galvanized, high strength, or ultra high strength steel, or you were weld bonding, and then you would set the thickness. Um, with the newer units today, they will do thicker pieces of stacks. Um, the earlier ones didn't have the amperage to do the thicker stacks where the new ones do. Uh, the fully automatics are, are great, but I think the problem is that the technicians rely upon that as the gospel, and they're not doing test welds, and they're just actually, oh yeah, we weld it up, and they're just moving on without checking to see, did that really do a good weld? Even though that the computer says, hey, it's a good weld. Yeah, well, did you, like when these, Toby just was talking about doing test welds, is that something in your shop that is common? A guy, does he jump on a car or does he do a test weld? Or? Well, I'll definitely say prior to Toby coming out, because obviously he's been out to our place a few times, and, and Toby, <laughs> when he comes out, he'll make sure that your, that your guys know what they need to do and what they don't need to do. But one of the most important things that he brought up is that, you know, whenever you see videos of the OEMs or you see videos of, of, of any, sort of, any sort of manufacturing facility, you see sparks flying. Whenever there's a, you know, whenever someone's doing a spot weld, so there's some technicians that auto, that automatically think that's that's a good, that's indicative to a good weld. Toby again has brought brought forth that whenever you're doing a spot weld, when you got sparks flying, we all know what that that means. That's not good. But but you'd be surprised the amount of people that don't know that. They, they, they think that that's okay. They think that, that it's going through as little a spark as possible is you know is, is the best is, is the best. But then my question, because this is for both of you. Shops you go into, back to power, if we could. Is it, are most of them still, are most shops you're seeing, are they still at 110? Or, or, or do you see shops that are making the move to three phase and 220? Or, or what are you seeing? I'm, I'm just curious for my own knowledge on that. 
I see, you know, 99% of the shops are on three phase okay. 220. Um, the problem is the downdraft spray booth has maxed out their electric service. Right. Or the compressor they put in, because their original compressor might have been single phase, is now three phase. Everything, and now they're adding their spot welder. And the spot welder, uh, if it was purchased 10 years ago, its amperage might have been 8,000 amps it's putting out. The requirement today is over 13,000 amps on a spot welder. So your spot welder worked great, you buy a brand new one, and you don't have enough power for it. So the, uh, on these new welders, when we are talking the higher amperage, when I was asking questions about these automatic settings, you know, there is an average, from what I'm told, in this automatic setting. So having the ability to override it and manually make your setting based on expertise of knowing exactly what kind of metal you're doing, exactly the thickness of it, uh, is, it seems to be very, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was on Toby's point, you know, you had to teach the person that. Yeah. Now, Dave, you mentioned that 99% of the shop you visit has three phase. Um, I've heard that industry uh, our industry, that really isn't a, uh, a realistic number. I mean, these are shops that you visited. Right. I wonder what that percentage really is. Well, I think it's a lot lower. Well, I mean, I'm in the shops every day, and yeah. uh, they, most shops don't even know what three phase is. Uh, the other day, a gentleman said, Oh, I have three phase, and he takes me over and he shows me a single phase plug. Um, for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, there's three phase will have four prongs and single phase will have three prongs. So look at your plug and if it's got four prongs, you have three phase in your, inside your facility. Yeah, the, the, the problem with the single phase is historically a single phase spot welder will only put out about 5,000 amps when today 13,000 amps is the requirement by the OEs. So. I don't know how that is going to take the industry, but, and I don't know if that weld is going to be replaced with a rivet, but for the welders we're looking at now, we've also noticed a few years ago, every welder had heavy cables, but now they have a big gun and just one cable going to the gun. When you have cable welders that have now gone to a single gun, it's because the amperage going through the cables, there's a magnetic field involved when those cables jump around and there's a limit on how much of a magnetic field should be around the person. So by going to the bigger gun, the gun becomes the transformer and you're taking DC voltage and changing to AC at the gun and that was able to take the amperage and pull it up to 13,000. So there is a safety factor involved when you have cable welders and they're laid over the shoulders or uh, between the legs, etc. They should be kept away from the body, used in their proper support, whatever is the specification of that manufacturer. But welders have evolved to the point where the standard seems to be the transformer gun. You notice a lot of the uh, spot welders you're referring to have counterbalancers on it to help take that cable and make it accessible for the technician to do the weld. Can we talk a little bit? You brought this up about the, like, about the uh, high electromagnetic waves around it. Let's talk a little about the safety, uh, first the car and the technician. Um, if you are welding on a car with these, you want to disconnect the negative posts of your battery. If you have a computer within 15 inches of where you're welding, you don't want to subject it to a lot of amperage being thrown through the electrical circuits of the metal being transferred. So if you, again, as an estimator or a technician, you're going to want to charge to remove that computer. You might have to reset it now. Now you have to scan it. So there are a lot of other ramifications. Another thing is, having your cable perpendicular to your car. If you run it this way, the, it has a more of a chance, like electromagnetic waves, 
uh, affecting the wiring in the vehicle, whereas if it's perpendicular, it goes off in a different direction. And so, so basically not winding it up so it's like a magnet. Right, exactly. Having it stretched out. Exactly. Um, safety. Um, we don't have to worry about the eye protection for as like with welding, but we do need to wear some sort of goggles in it. We should wear hand protection um, and, if, and a respirator. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, same precautions that you do with MIG welding, think about the same with spot welding. Hopefully, this gave you a great overview on what to look for in purchasing, in maintaining, and general housekeeping in your shop on spot welding. Again, this is the Society of Collision Repair Specialists. You can find us at scrs.com.